so um, as, as we heard, I'll talk a little bit about our story today. So that's the first part of the presentation, just how the company started. But also, I tried to throw in a little bit about how developers uh, can contribute and what they are doing in our company and what automotive, what the automotive industry needs in terms of developers and how, how this works right now. So first of all, I will show you how to embarrass yourselves in front of hundreds of people. So this was me something like 28 years ago. So as you can see, I was always crazy about cars. Um, my family has nothing to do with cars. I don't know why, but since before I could walk or talk, I was just crazy about cars all my life. And I wasn't really a good student. Um, I was average or uh, average if I want to be nice, maybe a little bit below. Um, so I didn't uh, really you know, have big dreams or big hopes, but um, I was going to a technical high school, and at the end of the high school, you have to do something physical. So I just built this as a school project, but, but my professor liked what I was doing, and he said, uh, why don't you go to this local competition of electronics? And I wasn't expecting anything, I wasn't uh, intending to do it, but for my professor, I did it, and I won surprisingly. And then they sent me to the national level, where I had also, I didn't hope for, for any result, but I won that, that as well on the national level, and then they sent me all over the world to represent Croatia. So before I was 18, I wrote two patents. I went all over the world, pitched, learned how to build stuff, uh, prototypes, uh, how to make PCBs and stuff like that. But my passion, my love was with cars. So as soon as I turned 18, uh, I bought an old 1984, so four years older than myself, uh, uh, BMW E30. And I did some pretty stupid things with that. So. So of course the car didn't survive for very long. <laughs> and I ended up with a hole under the bonnet. Um, so, and being from Croatia, you probably, so who knows who this guy on the left side is? <laughs> yeah, Tesla. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so that's, that's Nikola Tesla. He's born in Croatia, uh, what today is Croatia. Uh, and I was always inspired by him. And uh, I was fascinated by his inventions, especially the electric motor. I was always asking myself, why is nobody making a you know, fun and exciting electric car? Because the electric machine is so much better than a combustion engine to power anything, especially a sports car. So why was nobody using that? Uh, so not just to make a car environmental friendly, but really improve the performance. So when the gas engine blew up and I was stranded with the hole under the bonnet, um, I decided to uh, combine my two passions, electronics and cars. And in my garage, I converted this old BMW into an electric car wanting to prove that electric cars can be uh, competitive even on racetracks. So I wanted to race against gas-powered cars. So back then, there were no races for electric cars. Um, and everybody was laughing at me, like, what are you doing with this washing machine at the racetrack? Like, you know, can we charge the phone on your car and stuff like that? I heard all the jokes. And the car wasn't so great at the beginning. It would break. Uh, uh, some stuff would start burning, you know. Uh, <laughs> the batteries wouldn't work. It was very heavy and so on. But after every race, I kept going back into the garage and fixed the car, uh, repaired it, made it better. And I came back to the races and eventually started winning. So this is the first time I won in 2010. Um, and then the crowd realized, okay, this guy's stubborn. He keeps coming back, so it's interesting. So uh, at first they were laughing, and then they were coming to see that car on the racetracks because it was so different, like this little silent uh, BMW was faster than, you know, fire-spitting, 1,000-horsepower uh, race cars. And I was using it every day, um, also, you know, in the summer, in the winter. So I learned a lot how the car works in cold conditions, in hot conditions. And then eventually, in 2011, it really was fast, um, and I decided to try to break uh, world records. So on that day, this old BMW set five FIA and Guinness Book uh, world records, which, uh, which it still holds. Uh, so this old BMW is still a world record holder. Um, so that was kind of the way. <laughs> Thanks. So these were the early days. So great learning curve, you know, driving around, learning how to build stuff. But my real, uh, like, dream uh, was make my own car. And the car industry is very different from other industries. It's it has very, very high entry barriers. It's actually used in books 
as an example of an industry with high entry barriers. Because all the companies there are 50, 70, or 100 years old. They have bigger um, budgets than my country. They have tens of thousands of employees. And hundreds of people have tried to build their car company and failed. But two guys did it. Christian von Königsegg in Sweden and Horatio Pagani in Italy. And I said, I want to do the same. So I wanted to make my own electric car. And I wanted to make the fastest electric car in the world. And I was just one guy in a garage. Back then, I didn't have a company yet. Uh, and in this industry, which is dominated by the big dogs. And back then, when I started, you know, now electric cars are sexy. They are cool because there's Tesla and others. Uh, but back then, you know, uh, it was really at the beginning. And nobody was um, excited about it. They, were, they all thought I was crazy. So electric cars were nothing sexy back then, more something like this. And being in Croatia, so uh, there is not much car industry there. Maybe some of your Austrians here who went with your parents maybe 20 years ago to the seaside remember this car. Uh, so this was our country, U Yugoslavia, but uh, not really in Croatia. This was built in, Ser in what is today Serbia. So by combining electric cars back then in Croatia, <laughs> the odds weren't really good. But I was still crazy enough to try to do it. Um, in Croatia, so, well, we have a beautiful country, whoever was there, I'm sure you, you, you were blown away. I'm trying to be objective because it's my country, but I had the luck to see lots of the world, and Croatia is really, in my opinion, the most beautiful country. We have really lots of things there, but not for business and not for high tech. Um, so we have four, a little bit more than four million people. Every year it's getting less because also, yeah, because the young people emigrate to Ireland, Austria, Germany, uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, because there is no jobs in Croatia. It has a $60 billion GDP. Uh, we have not a single venture capital fund, which is terrible, actually. Um, Google has $66 billion revenue, which is more than all of Croatia, all of Croatia's GDP. Volkswagen has four times the revenue of Croatia's GDP. So it's really a tiny country. Um, and other countries were very strategic about electric cars. So the USA back then, so in 2008, had a, a program for $25 billion investing in uh, advanced uh, vehicles, so electric vehicles and hybrids and so on. Um, lots of, lot of that money went to Tesla. So don't get me wrong, I'm a very big fan of Tesla. But uh, w in the same um, market, you know, we had a lot of disadvantages uh, trying to, to start up. And developing a car is really difficult. So big car companies, they spent, for example, here $6 billion to develop a new car platform, or BMW $3 billion to develop their electric cars. And you can say that's big companies. That's how they do it. But here's an example of Fisker, which did the things exactly by the book. So uh, Henrik Fisker started a startup. Uh, I think it was like 2009, 2010, so about the same time as we did. Um, and they raised $1.4 billion, hired the right people, exactly ticking the boxes with the CVs from the car industry. And those people from the car industry, they knew how difficult it is to build a car. And they know it's impossible to build a car in a startup company. So they outsourced everything. The development was done by outside companies. The production, even the assembly of the car was done by external companies. And when you go to these companies for every bit and piece of your car, uh, for the light, you will pay 10 million euros. For the infotainment system, you will pay 20 million. For the seat, you will pay 5 million. For the door handle, you will pay 3 million because that's how the car industry got to work over the uh, decades of uh, transforming and becoming what it is today. So they did exactly the right thing, doing it by the book. Um, we did it exactly the way around, because we didn't have access to capital, and we didn't have um, experience, which was maybe good at the beginning, because we were blue-eyed and believed that we could do it, even though, uh, in, realistically, the chances were 0.00%. Um, and a lot of companies at that time went bankrupt um, were, when I started that were trying to do electric cars. So investors were also scared of electric uh, car industry. I had some early uh, investors which, so my, unfortunately 90% of my time uh, was uh, around keeping the company afloat, keeping it alive, talking to investors, doing you know, contracts and business cases, the boring stuff unfortunately. And this was the most difficult thing, actually, to get the funding for the company. At the beginning, uh, this, this was the first investor who was supposed to invest, but long story short, he didn't um, fully invest what he committed to. So we were left without any funding. We, uh, 
We, didn't, we couldn't pay the salaries, we couldn't pay the rent, we couldn't uh, pay the electricity. The electricity company came to cut off our electricity, the, uh, the heating company came to cut off our gas, um, and I had just convinced a few friends to give up their jobs and to join me, three or four guys, and there were older guys who had wives and families, and they had to convince their wives that this is a good idea, so just a few months after that, we were completely broke, and we actually lived off the credit card of this guy on the left, he had a big uh, uh, minus on the, he could go into depth on the credit card, so that was a good thing. Uh, <laughs> And we, we really worked our asses off. So um, we, we were literally sometimes for three or four days sleeping on the floor in the company, uh, not going home, you know, just uh, uh, having one goal in mind to build that car because we knew uh, that's our only chance. So uh, because we, one year in advance, we have booked a stand at the Frankfurt Motor Show in 2011 to, to show the car. Um, and we had to appear there. The, book, the stand was there, we couldn't not show up. So uh, even we didn't believe that we could do it. Uh, there was nothing just a few weeks before the show, so the parts were being built all around the company and so on, and we shown up there and we did a great job. Uh, the car was, was really nice looking, but it was very far from being a reality, from being able to, uh, to deliver it. Unfortunately, it's not an app that you can update once you ship it to customers. So, um, well, a little bit yes, but, but not the mechanical stuff. Um, so um, we, we were aware that we cannot um, rely on the car because it, took us, it will take us years to get to a stage where we can sell it to, to customers and deliver. So our only chance was doing things for other companies. And by building our car, we, um, we couldn't do it the way that Fisker did and most companies in the in industry do uh, by relying on outside companies. Uh, so, in the beginning, I just wanted to make a car. I didn't want to build a company that can do a chassis, an infotainment system. Uh, I didn't even in, in, envision that it would be uh, possible for us to do that. But talking to these suppliers, they either didn't want to talk to us because we were a new startup or a very small company, or if they wanted to work with us, they said, look, we cannot develop anything specifically for you. We can give you the old stuff. But to get access to the, I don't know, windscreen uh, wipers, you have to pay $3 million. To get access to the old infotainment system, you have to pay $10 million. We didn't have it, that funding. Luckily, that was probably the best thing that happened to us. And we had to try things on our own. Of course, the lights on the first car were totally crap. And you know, when we look at a lot of things on our early stage products, we, uh, we think now that you know, oh, we, we don't want to look at it. But we learned by making mistakes, by you know, uh, trial and error. And every time we did a new light, it was better and better, and now we are really good at that stuff. So by doing this, we learned a lot, and we could apply that to other projects. So we started to work for other companies. This was our first big project where we developed a whole car and produced it for another company, uh, which just saved us. In the last minute, just barely allowed us to stay alive. And that's how we continued. We did a lot of projects for the industry. Some uh, projects are public, some are not. Unfortunately, the, the industry is very secretive, you cannot say really what you are doing for whom and so on, but some customers are okay, so we can do it. Um, so these were, um, so instead of making our own car, we had to do stuff for others to make a survival. And after being successful with those projects and having happy customers, we finally got some funding. So this is venture capital investment in Croatia without us. Uh, so unfortunately, it's quite low, and this is with us. Uh, so we raised, unfortunately, <laughs> there's... So we raised almost uh, 60 million euros as of today. Um, now it's really easy for us to raise money. Everybody is coming to us. Um, the investors are literally running through our doors. But uh, before that, like until last year, it was really, really difficult, nearly impossible to raise money. In the first five years, I think probably maybe except for two or three months, I never had the money to pay the next salary on the account. So every month it was just bare survival. That was, that was actually the hardest thing. And Part of the reason is the location, because investors are a little bit scared to invest in uh, Southeast Europe and especially, I think, Croatia. Um, but after the company is you know, uh, too far to be ignored, like once you overgrow the, the location issue, then it's not 
a problem anymore. So now investors don't care. They actually think it's a nice story that we grew out of Croatia. But a few years ago, they were like, whoa, whoa, a little startup from Croatia, never heard of it. We won't invest into that. So anyways, from this garage uh, where we built the BMW, this was last year. And since then, we've grown double uh, pretty much. So now we are almost 400 people. So having quite a big growth. Um, and we want to continue that. So we really, you know, we are in this industry where we can't be, but we can stay a really small company in being, you know, just an engineering company and building prototypes, uh, or become really big. There's nothing in between. Um, so we, we have decided also because of taking venture capital money, be careful with that. If you take it, it's a little bit like signing a contract with the devil. Uh, they invest money into you, but of course expect a big growth. So you're always forced to really, you know, have exponential growth, double, triple every year, that's, that's quite a challenge. So we are also very international, 26 nationalities, which I'm very proud of from all over the world. And uh, just to get back on the product, the whole point is uh, making cars more fun and exciting. Um, so for example, what we can do with electric motors, uh, here is one axle of the concept one of our old model. So we have two motors in one housing, left and right, and we can control each of them separately. So each is controlling one wheel and one of these in the front, one in the rear. So we have independent control of all four wheels, so we can do things with um, our system that are not possible with traditional cars. So this was our first model, the concept one. Um, quite a um, significant car. It was by many uh, regarded as the uh, first electric super, real uh, supercar or hypercar. So 1,088 horsepower, 2.6 uh, seconds from 0 to 100. And um, when I started, you know, who, who would help me in Croatia? Who, who could I ask? Because there is no industry. And I asked the, the University of Mechanical Engineering, who has a part for automotive, and they told me, it's impossible to build a car in Croatia. The sooner you give up, the less people will go under with you. So I think we have proven <laughs> that Trust we can build a car and a pretty fast one. Yeah, so even Jeremy Clarkson, who hates electric cars and so on, he said he never saw some, uh, anything go as fast as that, and that this car changed his mind So about electric cars. So I think the professors at the university were a little bit wrong. Um, but there are many, I'm not sure if you have seen this episode, after this race, a few days later, Hammond crashed the car, and like he flew for 100 meters, and uh, the car caught fire. Um, it was... You know, it was a really, really difficult situation for us. It was in every news media outlet in the world, probably. Uh, it was a Saturday. I was in the company. We were following the telemetry data of the car, and one of the guys just called us. I, just, I will always remember, he said, he crashed, the car is burning, he's alive. That's the three things he told me. <laughs> and I just went white. Uh, I didn't tell anything to the guys in the company. I went home, and from the moment I uh, went from the company to, to my flat, it was 10 min uh, 30 minutes, and from that, uh, in that 30 minutes, it was everywhere in the world. So all our investors were calling us, all our customers. Uh, we were just about to close a funding round, which was really like we really, really, really needed the money, and it was really a difficult situation. So this was a very public uh, disaster, uh, which turned out, well, many people tell me that's the best thing that happened to us, uh, but I'm not so sure. I think I lost 10 years of my life then. Uh, but... Um, uh, but uh, there are disasters like this every week. I mean, not really like this, but some are public, some are not, some happen internally, some externally. So when a company is doing difficult things and trying to expand so fast, you know, uh, it might sound, seem rosy from outside, everything is nice and dandy, but uh, I guess that there are always a lot of challenges. 
So the C2 is the new car which we, are, which we have launched in Geneva, so 1,914 horsepower, so it's the most powerful production car, uh, under two seconds, uh, 200, 412 kilometers per hour top speed. Um, beautiful car. Uh, so uh, also very high tech, so we are developing it uh, to be also to have some autonomous features. I'll come to that later. So it's completely designed and engineered internally. So from the 400 people, we have almost uh, 200 in design, uh, sorry, in engineering and uh, development. Um, so it's a lot of different areas, a lot of different fields from chassis, suspension, battery, powertrain, uh, aerodynamics, cooling systems, and we do that all in-house. So that's very, very unique uh, because we are using this car as a showcase of, of what we as a company can do. And uh, regardless of being a very small manufacturer with very low production numbers, the car has to survive uh, and pass all the tests like the big car companies. So a, a Golf has to go through the same tests like our C2. So we, unfortunately, we'll have to crash next year uh, more than 10 of these cars, I think like 12 or 13. Um, so that's very painful. But um, it's very interesting what you can do in computer modeling today. So these are not just some nice videos. This is thousands and thousands of hours of engineering behind it, the supercomputers rendering those, uh, doing those calculations. Because there's millions of uh, po um, of uh, pieces that are characterized with different materials with carbon fiber, with aluminum, with steel, um, that have to behave same as the real physical model. So anyways, the company is divided in two areas. So our supercars, which are serving as a showcase of what we can do, uh, and of course have to be a profitable business on its own, but the real scalable business is in the technology, where we are providing technology solutions to other OEMs. Um, and a beautiful thing about the industry is, uh, we know today for a fact that it will grow 20, 30, 40 times in the next decades. So there are different predictions, different crystal balls. This crystal ball from Bloomberg is saying that in uh, 2040, it will be 35% uh, market share, while today it's just 1%. So 35 times more. And there needs to be lots of companies like us that will fuel that change by uh, helping the car manufacturers to develop all of these electric cars. Um, so our mission is to help this growth, to help the industry turn uh, electric. And why does it make sense? Uh, first of all, it's efficient. So if you look at the combustion engine, so if, you, uh, if we say that 100% of the energy comes to the car, which is not the case because uh, it takes a lot of energy to drill, fuel, to refine it, and to transport it, but uh, the combustion engine is very inefficient, so in the end we have like uh, 20 to uh, 30 percent or 35 maybe percent of efficiency of the combustion engine while the electric motor is 90 plus percent efficient. Of course the batteries are heavy and it takes a lot of emissions to produce the batteries but uh, it's now on a tipping point where it really makes sense. So this is what we typically do, the, uh, the whole powertrain system, so the motors, the gearboxes, the inverters, the battery pack, the electronics. Um, and infotainment system. So we make the concept together with the customer, with the big car manufacturers. We develop it, we make a prototype, do the validation and industrialization. That's a really tough thing, uh, because when you ship uh, hundreds or thousands of components around the world uh, or to your customer and he builds it into, your, into their cars, and then it goes around the world, and then uh, parts start failing in Hong Kong, in Sweden, in uh, Spain, in... Uh, I don't know, Mexico, then you have a real problem. Then, then your company will go bust very soon. Well, we had to learn it the hard way, of course. We, of course, we did a lot of mistakes at the beginning. Um, but now, you know, we spend a lot of more time testing and validating so that we are sure that our components uh, work. Because it, the worst thing is to, um, to not uh, perform or to have failures in the field and then production. So we work with a lot of the big and the small companies. So for example, Renault and Aston Martin, a lot of them, the really interesting projects we cannot talk about yet. Unfortunately, the industry is very closed in, in a way. We are very open on the other side about what we do, but what we do for our customers, sometimes we cannot really show. But some things I can show, for example, for the Aston Martin Volkery, we are developing the, uh, and producing the battery pack and the infotainment system and connectivity. So the hardware and software of that for, for development and for every car. Or, for example, to go back at the beginning when Christian Koenigsegg was just, um, uh, he was my hero and my role model, and now we are doing the battery packs uh, for his cars. Um, so that's kind of a dream come true that I'm very happy about. So now we are, we are going to more of the technical part of the presentation. 
Um, so there are many, many, many tools that we are using uh, in development. Uh, th I just made this slide this morning, so I, I think I forgot lots of stuff, and it's really a pain in the neck to find all of these logos. <laughs> uh, so uh, th this is just one part of it. So we have CAD development. That's what people probably mostly uh, associate with uh, the auto industry. But there is uh, computer-aided engineering, so lots of simulations and supercomputers, uh, UX design, uh, product design, simulations, and stuff like that. But I think what's interesting you most is uh, the software development. So we have embedded software development, which is running on the, uh, the real-time operating uh, systems in the, um, on, on the hardware that's running the 12-volt systems and so on of the car. And we have the, um, the other part of the software development, which is more for the infotainment system and for uh, the web and so on, uh, which, which is also becoming more and more important uh, in the car industry. Of course, the car industry is still very heavy on the classical things, so on the mechanical engineering, um, on hardware design, and so on. But the software part is becoming more and more important. And a really <laughs> difficult thing for the industry is these, uh, the, the software is really expensive. So we are investing millions into that. It can happen that uh, one engineer has uh, more than 100,000 euro worth of software on his computer. Uh, so that's, that's also another entry barrier. I guess that for just making apps and websites and stuff like that, you, you don't have this entry barrier with software tools. So uh, I'm going to try to, well, we are running out of time a little bit, but I'm going to try um, to explain a little bit some things about uh, aut uh, autonomous driving and infotainment and M2M. So autonomous driving is a really big uh, change in industry. It will turn the industry completely on its head, completely. Uh, much more than electrification. And the real breakthrough was machine learning and deep learning, um, which enabled um, the industry to develop algorithms um, to perceive their surroundings, to make decisions, and so on. So uh, there is lots of things uh, autonomous driving can do. So first of all, um, I'm a car guy, and I still think that autonomous driving, so taking away the driving from people, is a very good thing. So just in America alone, there's 1.5 million people dying every year on the roads. Uh, the roads can be used much better, utilized much better by autonomous driving. We, the biggest expense for people after their housing is buying their cars, which are standing around for 95% of the time. And we are spending more time uh, nursing them, send, uh, you know, bringing them to service, than, to, than we took care about us, about uh, going to the doctor and so on. So in reality, when you look objectively, uh, on it, and the impact on the environment and so on will be much reduced with autonomous vehicles. So uh, we have, for example, in our car, eight cameras, six radars, two lidars, uh, 72 processors, not just for autonomous driving, but for everything else, um, to uh, make the car see around and have the processing power to make decisions. Decision making is really important. So first perceive, uh, which the car can do really good, because it has eight eyes, it has radars, which we don't have. It has LIDAR, so, so light ri uh, radars. Um, it has ultrasonic uh, sensors, um, and can see the surroundings much better. But then it has to understand what's going on. So for example, the car here, uh, labeled with V3, it sees the car, but what will the car do? What's the probability of that guy uh, coming into, onto the road? We people will understand, if he moves slowly, there is a good chance that he will just jump in front of you. But the machine also needs to understand that. And based on the likelihood of that, it has, to, it has to address the likelihood of that event happening and react. So what will it do? Slow down, make an evasive maneuver. Um, so the, the uh, sensors are collecting incredible amounts of data. So our car uh, collects six terabytes of data in one hour. In 1,000 hours of driving, that's six petabytes. One petabyte of storage is about, I think, 200,000 euro currently. So when developing cars, and there is a law that says, um, or a rule in the industry, that says that you have to store the data based on which you develop autonomous driving uh, for 15 years, or anything in the car. Uh, any data that you uh, use to develop the car has to be stored for 15 years. So with autonomous driving, because you're using machine learning, you don't know exactly how the neural network built. So you need to take, you need to store all of the inputs that you got during the development. So the development can get really expensive if you need to purchase all of that um, storage capacity. And that's something that we are currently doing. We are building a data center that, that's, um, that stores more, that has more capacity than all of Croatia's 
uh, storage combined. Yeah, so that's another barrier. And then, well, this is something I'm not, I don't think it's really uh, that big of a deal, but it's interesting. So there is an MIT uh, website, it's called The Moral Machine. I encourage you to go there. Um, it gives you choices. So how do we want the car to behave? Do we want it to behave like a human? Are we sure about that? So uh, it gives us various situations. So here, for example, on the left side, we have uh, a car that has either to crash and um, kill the passengers or to crash and kill um, or to kill the, the pedestrians. How does that decision, how do you make that decision? Are the people in the car going to die or the pedestrians? How is that decision changed if uh, uh, the pedestrians were going over a red light? How is that decision going to be changed if the pedestrians are bad people and you know it for some reason? How is that? <laughs> yeah, in China, people are ranked, so uh, the Chinese will know exactly if somebody is a good guy in the uh, eyes of the Chinese government. Uh, or um, if the people in the car are old and uh, the pedestrians are kids. Uh, so these are, these are some interesting uh, things. We are not fooling ourselves that we can be better than Waymo or Google who, uh, or Uber or whoever invests billions into autonomous vehicles, but we, are, we think that there are some very specific um, topics for, uh, for sports cars. So ca how can sports cars and autonomous vehicles work together? We think there are very interesting use cases, so we are developing something that's called driver coach, where the car helps you to be a better driver, to drive around the racetrack, to show you the ideal lines and stuff like that. So we are developing this for the C2. But there are still lots of challenges, like redundant systems. You have to have, like in an airplane, redundant, redundancy in the brakes, in the steering, uh, and the industry is not there yet. Everybody's saying, like, yeah, yeah, the technology is there, but the regulation is, is slow. It's not the truth. Try to build an autonomous car today, and you'll not find the redundant steering system. You'll not find the redundant, uh, the redundant brake, brake system. So these are things that are now coming. Then the computing power, which is quite expensive still all the data that I have mentioned, uh, the ethical uh, perspective, and then also social behavior. So how will the drivers react because they have to coexist for some time? So now I'm trying to, I will try to go quickly through another part. So this is um, another part of our activity. So we developed the, also the infotainment hardware and software internally. The team that's doing that is actually here. So maybe you can, you can talk to them later. Uh, can you maybe guys raise your hands if you, yeah. So, uh, Part of the team is there, so uh, you can ask those guys questions if you, if you have them. Uh, so cars are being more and more connected to the cloud. So for example, the system that we have has a customer-facing interface, so what you see here on the phone, and the OEM-facing interface. So the, the OEM sees a lot of more data. He can update the car. He can send software updates and improve the car over time and have a lot of more information than the end user, but the end user can see where the car is located, uh, turn on the air conditioning and stuff like that. So uh, just to demonstrate how a simple operation works, so you push a button on the screen to raise the car. Uh, so what happens? So you have the ICU, the uh, infotainment control unit. Uh, it's a hardware board, um, which has an operating system on it, which is um, embedded Linux distribution. Uh, our, our guys are doing the, uh, our own Linux version. Um, so it has a CAN interface towards the other car system. It has a touchscreen interface. It has an um, app, which is based on Qt, on top of it, and then the screen. So when you push a button on the, on the screen, um, it sends a CAN message to the BCM, so the body control module. So the body control module is, um, doesn't have an operation system. It's a bare metal uh, code running on it. So this system then, so the, the infotainment system is just giving the instruction to other systems in the vehicle to do their job. Then the uh, body control uh, module um, reacts and turns on the hydraulic pump, uh, monitors the pressure, and uh, then the suspension raises. Or um, whenever something like that in the car happens, the telemetry control unit, another hardware piece, um, sends this, this, collects the data uh, and sends it to a service, uh, server in our company, or anywhere, it doesn't really matter. Um, the data. Uh, is then being sent to a backend interface where the OEM or the end user can um, see different parameters and send data back to control the vehicle or to 
uh, or uh, to update the software. This is, of course, also uh, safety critical. So a lot of these things, uh, safety critical is a big word in automotive. So um, having redundancies and um, uh, safety networks to um, not allow outside um, people to access the vehicle systems is very important. Um, these are some of the technologies and tools being used for, um, for the development of that, what I just showed you. And just the just last thing, so we have a sister company, Grape. These are our yellow million, minions over here, uh, which are really making cool um, electric bicycles. And we are doing something really, really innovative now, really cool with our new model. So uh, it has cameras and sensors and a whole bunch of stuff to take the biking experience from the physical uh, world to, to the virtual world also. Um, so what we are doing, we are collecting uh, data from the whole bike from all of its systems and enabling uh, gaming experiences. So, for example, uh, you can be at two locations with your friend and um, through, the, through the interfaces you can connect. Um, you can see what your friend is doing because he has a camera and you have a camera uh, in real time and you can uh, compete in terms of speed or um, uh, heart rate or how much calories you burn, uh, one against the other in a crowd, uh, 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 kind of make competitions in gaming uh, based on your location or on your age or whatever, or how long you have your bike. So this is really something interesting to take the biking experience uh, and gamify it completely. So we are still growing strong. Um, we want to do lots of interesting things. We have come quite a long way, but we are still at our beginning. and. We, we are working really hard, there's lots of work to do, but we also want to have fun sometimes, this is our Christmas party. And um, we, need a lot, we, are, we are looking for the right people, for people who want to join us, so if you like, um, go to our website on the career site and we would be happy to see you there. So thank you very much for listening. Great job, Mati, thank you. So we have a bunch of questions for you. One is, do you have any plans for the mass production of cars for regular consumers? Oh, that's a great question that I get really often, especially in Croatia, like why don't you make a car for Croatians? Uh, <laughs> well, it's a, it's a very, uh, building a car is very, very capital intensive. Uh, so, Tesla has raised $14 billion so far. I think they have 30,000 employees, 30,000 employees. They have been at the right time, like they got their factory almost for free. They have been at the right place in Silicon Valley, and they got, uh, you know, they are ahead of everybody else uh, so far. So, um, and for them it's still difficult to produce a mass market car. They are just starting with that. And for us, it's impossible to scale that much. So, uh, doing this, what we are doing is, not a lifetime challenge, it's, it's, it's five lifetime challenges. The odds of doing this are really like almost zero of, of you know, uh, coming to, to where we are and to get where, where we want to get in a few years. So we will not, we will always, and also we don't want to compete with our customers, which are car companies. As long as we stay in the low numbers, uh, we, we are not a, a threat for them. So we will scale in terms of our technology being in uh, mass-produced cars of other car customers, of other car manufacturers, but our own cars, for now, the plan is that we stay in the high-end, uh, high-performance market where we are best at, where our passion is also. We, our, we are passionate about really building high-performance cars, the best what's possible, to push the limits, and not to... Um, it's not really realistic that we build a mass-produced car. Okay. They want to know, what car are you driving on a daily basis? Yeah, uh, well, believe it or not, uh, so I, I sold uh, everything I had in the early stages of the company. I didn't have a car for seven years. Uh, I don't have the money to buy one of our own cars <laughs> <laughs> yet. <laughs> uh, well, actually, I had an offer also. Uh, well, I get offers to sell the company all the time, but uh, I, I want to build the company, so I'm not really um, driven by, by, by money. So I'm driving a 10-year-old Audi with 400,000 kilometers. 
<laughs> yeah, but I hope that will change soon. <laughs> well, with, I want one C2 one day, yeah. <laughs> nice. What kind of improvements did your team make to the Remax concept after the crash of the concept one? Oof, that's... Uh, the, the, con the C2 doesn't have anything to do with the concept one. So when we did the first concept one, uh, the company existed for like eight months. We were six guys uh, having no idea what we were doing. Uh, we were all doing it for the first time. We didn't have any money. Uh, so now we are a company of almost 400 people. We have proper funding. We have done a lot of things for the industry. We have learned a lot. We have international experience now. So what we are doing with the C2 is something completely, completely different. It's like comparing the iPhone 1 with, or, or even, I don't know, the Nokia 30, uh, 3310 with, um, with the iPhone X. So uh, it's, it's, you learn so much. Uh, you know, that, that's what I said at one point. When we look at some things we did for the Concept 1, we are a little bit embarrassed. Uh, but they say if you are not embarrassed with your first product, then you launched too late. <laughs> <laughs> Good. How can we as software developers add value to a company like yours? What are the hot areas? Well, I would say, first of all, that there is a broader picture, that there is, the door is open for new things. So um, new companies cannot be better in making a light, which the industry is doing for like 40, 50 years, 100 years, whatever. You cannot be better in making a seat. You know, there are plenty of companies uh, specialized in that and doing just that. The new things that are... Um, changing the industry, autonomous driving, and you have a thousand categories in there. Um, Internet of Things, uh, so machine-to-machine -machine communication, infotainment, uh, connectivity, um, uh, all the new business models. Um, blockchain is also going to impact uh, the car industry a lot. So uh, developers have a big role there, um, especially um, in, the, in the infotainment side and connectivity. Um, not just in our company, but this, that's an opportunity for new companies to start and uh, develop products for the industry independently. Mm. Which part of the software in the new car was the hardest to get right? Um, well, the auto industry is different. Uh, if you are really interested into that, Google ISO 26262. Um, so that's a safety... Um, that, that's a process how you have to develop safety-critical software. So to develop a software that just, I don't know, uh, for example, our torque vectoring system, which distributes the power between the four wheels. So if we do something wrong there, and let's say you're driving 300 kilometers per hour, and the algorithm go, go, goes crazy, it will lock a wheel. Let's say, like, let's say that this can happen. Uh, what happens then at 300 kilometers per hour, you have one wheel locked, you will for sure die. Uh, so that's a, safe, a really safety-critical system. So then you have the uh, procedures which, which describe how you, uh, how you categorize how safety-relevant the system is. In that case, it's a, sa it's a ASA level D, the highest level. It's ABCD. And that means that you have to do a lot of um, architectural uh, uh, things uh, so the architecture have to, has to be developed and then the code itself and the reviews and the process how you develop the code to make it safety critical um, Compliant so I would say that the hardest thing is to get the software any software in the car safety critical That's really a difficult thing uh, in terms of complexity of the software of course anything related to, to uh, Autonomous driving to motion planning and stuff like that. That's a big challenge in, in the classical way, I would say the torque vectoring with the four motors. But that, that's more of a, of a physics and engineering challenge than really code. The, the, the development, the coding, is not such a big deal in that, in that case. OK, great. And before you take off, one last question. What's your favorite electronic car joke? Favorite electric car joke? <laughs> I don't know, really. Uh, <laughs> I heard so many of them. Well, there was one when I was racing with a, a BMW uh, uh, on a racetrack. They, were, they told me, like, you know, one of the jokes was, um, don't come too close to us, a thunder will hit us. But then it actually happened. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> I checked the battery, it didn't charge. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Great talk, Maxi. Thank you.